Welcome everyone to our today's special seminar. It's a great pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Professor Wolf Singer, from the Max Planck Institute and Ernst Schwingmann Institute uh, at, on brain research in uh, Frankfurt. Um, there's, I could take half of the seminar just to introduce uh, you, but I was, I was asked to keep it short, which would be very difficult. Uh, so, uh, Wolf started studying medicine at the University of Munich and in, at the Sorbonne in Paris. Um, and did his thesis in the Max Planck Institute for Psychiatry uh, in Munich as well with Kreuzfeld. I guess that's the one from the Kreuzfeld Jakob. Uh, the Sun. The Sun. The Sun. All right. Uh, and uh, the, the thesis was in the role of telencephalatic commissioners in bilateral EEG synchrony. So, we see already then. He was interested in synchronization phenomena. Um, he afterwards did several postdocs, and I, I will skip now several uh, intermediate uh, postdoc positions. Just yes, jump into now. <laughs> jump into now. Wow. That's a big jump. Mm -hmm. uh, so he became an independent group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Psychiatry in Munich and professor for physiology at the Technical University in Munich. Before one year later, he became director at the Max Planck Institute for Brain Research in Frankfurt. At the same time, he's founding director of the Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Studies, the founding co-director of the Brain Imaging Center in Frankfurt, and founding director of the Hans Strickland uh, Forum, as well as the founding director of the Hans Strickland Institute, where he still is uh, to date. Um, the topics uh, of Wolf are very manifold, that I could also talk very long during higher cognitive uh, uh, mm -hmm. physiological manifestation of attention and recognition and a lot work on the binding problem but that's only a few among many interests. Uh, he received a lot of prizes and recognition where I have to uh, <laughs> Long member of the uh, Pope Academy of Sciences in Rome, uh, member of the Russian Academy of Science, uh, a, an advisor to the Pope for cultural uh, aspects. Is that correct? Papes, Papes, is that the, uh, Pope uh, Council? No real idea what it is. But <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there would be a lot more, but I keep it short. Uh, we first met within uh, a center of excellence uh, back in the 1990s on complex systems where it was rather unusual to have a uh, brain scientist at that time in, uh, in that field. I was a tiny PhD student uh, and very fascinated to see uh, the studies on synchronization in the brain to which we got back much later when we found synchronization in lasers. Uh, and contacted Wolf and he immediately resonated uh, a lot with that and since then uh, we are in contact finding, trying to find some cross fertilization uh, between neuroscience aspects, photonics aspects, complex systems aspects. I think that will also be part of the, the presentation we will hear about today. Cortical dynamics challenge, as challenging as ever. We're very happy to have you. Thank you Ingo for your kind words. Um, these are all attributes of aging, you know. <laughs> <coughs> I'm very glad to be here. It's the first time I'm in the Institute. Uh, I've been in Mallorca many times <coughs> at places that I really love, uh, far away from the coast, up in the mountains. <laughs> this is a wonderful island. And I hope that um, our collaborations will continue and it will be just, uh, now I know where the Institute is, we'll be coming back, hopefully, as many times as possible. So. Cortical dynamics, um, he already alluded to it, it took me 40 years to move up from 10 hertz synchrony between two hemispheres to 40 hertz, so it took some time. Um, please do interrupt because I understand you are a very heterogeneous population and something that may be very redundant to one half, may be complicated for the other, and vice versa, so ask, interrupt, let's be informed as much as possible. Um, there is, there is a huge explanatory gap in the neurosciences uh, in the moment. And this is 
Um, on the one hand, we have a very detailed knowledge about individual neurons. We also know a lot about the microcircuits, mainly because we can study these properties in vitro. And on the other hand, <coughs> we have a large body of, of knowledge uh, coming from non-invasive imaging technology, which shows us, complementing neuropsychological research, um, how functions are localized in the brain. We now have learned that these are very distributed systems that form on the fly according to goals and contexts, functional networks form, and we know approximately about the dimensions of these networks and, and their changes. So we know at the high cognitive level where things happen, and when they happen, and in the, at the micro level we, we know all the nitty gritty details of the nuts and the bolts, but in between there's ignorance. We have very little understanding of how these higher cognitive and executive functions emerge from the local interactions between neurons and how these are integrated across uh, the brain at large scale. And some of what I will be saying is trying to fill in a little bit in this gap, which is still huge, and we don't know whether we'll be able to actually bridge it in the decades to come. Um, what are the new data that um, make us think that the conventional approach that we have been following, namely guided by behaviorist uh, theories that the brain is essentially a stimulus response machine, um, which should be analyzable if we just meticulously follow the uh, processing of signals from the surfaces of the receptors all the way into the brain until we get. Um, and this is what we did successfully for many decades. Chains described meticulously the response properties of neurons, thinking that if we had walked through the system, we would have understood it. And now we have learned that we have learned a lot, but we did not understand it. And the reasons are that on this very fruitful path, we discovered a lot of things which are incompatible with this uh, simplistic behaviorist idea. So there were insights coming from the anat anatomic analysis of circuitry. Uh, we call this conectomics. Um, we learned that a prevailing principle in the organization of the mammalian brain, but it applies for the vertebrate brain in general, I think, is recurrency, that most of the nodes are reciprocally coupled. We learned that another principle is distributedness. There are many functions occurring simultaneously in different local processes that are integrated in some not well understood way. Then uh, we had to say goodbye to the idea that the brain is a nicely hierarchically organized system where information is um, converging into a conversion center somewhere high up in the processing hierarchy where all the information is available that one needs for the interpretation of a coherent scene, for example, or for the planning of actions. We don't find these centers. The hierarchy is flat. There is a little bit of hierarchy, but it is soft. And then we learn, and this is a quite amazing recent finding by uh, Kennedy and Lyon, who did meticulous tracing studies uh, between, uh, tracing the connections between the nodes, that 60% of the possible connections between nodes are actually realized. This is a fantastic density of, of connectivity in the brain. Somebody wanted to contact me. Uh, <clears throat> then we have learned from multi-site recordings, which is a fairly recent development, about a decade ago, uh, we started to record from more than one node at the same time. For you that may seem absurd that it took us so long, but it's technically difficult. And now we have learned that the ongoing activity in the brain, which as long as we looked at a single element, looked like noise because we saw a lot of variability that we could not explain because we didn't see the partners, we didn't see the network, is not noise, but the ongoing activity in the brain when it's just hiding along and doing nothing, is highly structured. And we now think that this ongoing structured activity is presenting all the time hypotheses um, which then are matched with incoming sensory signals and the result of this matching process is what eventually gives rise to experience. We have learned that there is a rigid anatomical backbone that is genetically fixed and this is what makes our brains comparable. But on top of this um, skeleton of connections, 
um, these dynamics neurons get associated dynamically into large functional networks that sometimes spend the whole um, the whole brain in both hemispheres. Large networks that are dynamically formed in the task and go dependent way. Um, and then we encounter unexpectedly rich dynamics. We see that um, clusters of neurons can oscillate in all sorts of frequency ranges, I will come back to this. They can synchronize also in a context and state-dependent way. Uh, we see phase shifts between those oscillations and we see that if you record from many neurons simultaneously, um, we obtain large, high-dimensional vectors that change in time all the time. It's very unstationary, this system. <coughs> so here's a few examples on the scalability of these principles. If one records simultaneously from, from a number of, of neurons, for example, in, in, in the primary visual cortex, these are different electrode sites, uh, one records bunches of neurons, analyzes the interactions between the neurons, and if there is interaction in the form of cross-correlation, for example, one puts, puts a line there. Most of these interactions are reciprocal, and if one analyzes them statistically, uh, it seems as if it were small world networks in general, or rich club net networks. They have the characteristics of these networks. If one does the same analysis at the next level of, of organization, this is where cortical areas are connected to each other. One obtains graphs like this one. Here, each of these red dots stands for an area of cerebral cortex that is specialized for certain functions, visual cortex, auditory cortex, and so on. The human brain has about 120 of these identifiable areas. And there's, uh, there's optimal communication among nodes. One needs a minimum number of intervening nodes to get from any place to any other place, and, and the path length is short. And it also allows, and we have evidence for this now, the coexistence of local processes that get integrated in globally ordered states, especially cognitive operations that occur at the platform of consciousness. They appear to be highly integrated many areas collaboration. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, when I read all this, uh, for example, optimal communication among nodes and all these uh, um, claims, I mean, what exactly do you mean by that? I mean, that there is not another way that is making the connection of the, of the level between person no shorter? Is this what you refer? Well, we could have, we could have for example, uh, a rule that is the nearest neighbor connectivity scheme, which for some time has been actually maintained as a rule. Uh, then if you want to go from the back of the brain to the front of the brain, you have to go over billions of neurons in order to get there. Um, this is not the way it's done. There are many nearest neighbor connections within the areas, but then there are strategic long-range connections, which go from one hub to the next, which allow you to come from the back to the front um, with mainly only two switching stations. This is what I mean with... Um, but in which sense it's optimal because uh, you could think in, a, in, other, in other architectures, for example, the star-like uh, topologies where the, the communication is much it's more efficient, but biologically probably it's not efficient because you would need to keep very long brain connection. And also the brain changes, right? Uh, with aging. So when is optimal? I mean, at the beginning, at the end, is all the time optimal or is it just a... Well, it, it optimizes the it, it, redu it optimizes the path length. Uh, you, you need a minimum number of switching stations and uh, physical length of fibers to come from one point to the next with this with this sort of scheme. Um, it's you could have also an all to all connectivity scheme, which is much too expensive in terms of hardware, is not realized. It's a compromise between everybody against everybody, or a random network, or a nearest neighbor network. And the way it is done uh, is optimized um, to reduce path length and uh, economize on, on wiring material. So this is maybe probably also optimal in terms of energy consumption. This is something nature is very much interested in. This whole thing only requires uh, 30 watt energy when it's working, which is amazingly little. Um, yeah, but 
having such a densely interconnected network um, raises a lot of problems of coordination because not every neuron, not every message emitted by every neuron can be heard by everybody else. This would, would just make a mess. It's like tuning a receiver into all sending stations um, that are within the range of reception. Um, the brain can't work that way. So there must be strategies, mechanisms that allow for dynamic routing of signals from uh, sending station to a subset of receivers. And this must be gated dynamically. And um, we believe that the only way to do this is to, to dynamically coordinate the communication among those uh, nodes because we know that they are bound into functional networks ad hoc on the fly within a few hundred milliseconds in a task and goal dependent way. So there's certain nodes that do not participate in certain operations, but they can become recruited into others. And this must be done in a very flexible and, and fast way because we can change our point of fixation every 200 milliseconds. Actually, we do this when we look around, in, in, normally without constraints, which means that new functional networks need to be coordinated at this temporal pace. So 200 to 300 milliseconds, the whole thing can be reconfigured. So we believe that if one wants to temporarily coordinate these distributed processes, the neuronal activity itself needs to have a minimum of temporal structure. It cannot just be random, it cannot just be possible. And there is evidence that there is temporal structure in neuronal activity because nearly all networks in the brain that have been explored so far, um, they can oscillate. They can do this in very different frequency ranges. And this then allows the temporal passing of activity. And you will see that this becomes important again. Um, in addition, it introduces phase as a coding damage. And also this seems to be used by the brain. So for those who are not familiar with these um, recordings of neuron activity, this is what one gets. If one records from a cluster of neurons and activates them appropriately with a stimulus that drives them, one observes quite often that uh, they engage in these uh, synchronous cluster discharges that are spaced regularly, regularly in terms of biology means uh, plus minus 10 milliseconds or so. In this case, they engage in a rhythm of approximately 40 hertz, so each of these needles is the discharge of a neuron, one needle of maybe five or six different neurons. They discharge measures the integrated activity over such clusters with a low pass filter. One gets these fairly regular oscillatory activities, and they occur in over a wide fre frequency range. We now know that uh, very slow oscillations have 0.1 hertz or even below, and the, the fastest oscillations one can observe, they go up to 200 hertz. And one finds these oscillations in all structures of the brain investigated so far. These oscillations have a few interesting properties. First, these oscillatory signals can synchronize over some distance. If one records simultaneously from two clusters of neurons, activates them appropriately, runs cross chorelograms, one very often gets this sort of modulated cross chorelogram indicating that these two oscillatory processes were synchronized and very often is close to zero phase lag. And this type of synchrony is occurred, is observed um, within centimeters. It can occur across cortical areas and it can be centimeters and even across the two hemispheres, in which case it can be distances of 10 centimeters or more in the human together. Because um, we had found that this long distance synchrony can occur as close as your face lake, and our colleagues here said this is impossible because you have delay lines. Problem. Another interesting property of these synchronization phenomena is that they, they are context dependent. They are not just passively reflecting. They can <coughs> um, self-organize, and they can also um, use constellation or states. We will see examples. Which have 
their receptive fields, this is visual neurons out in the visual world, like a single coherent stimulus or contour activated by two fragmented stimuli that move one correlated. Um, this is reflected in the breakdown. from the black surface here to about the same amount and they are responding but they are no longer synchronized. So some of the semantic relations between those stimulus segments they are expressed in either synchrony or the breakdown of synchrony. Single object produces synchrony but does not. Suggesting this was a very early hypothesis that the degree of synchrony expresses for other neurons in the brain that listen to this, to which extent those uh, two segments are related. In this case, they are continuous and move with the same speed in the same direction. So one object. What makes these oscillations, and this is true for oscillations in all frequency ranges, also interesting. Uh, these fast frequency oscillations, they are is awake and attentive, by expectancy to act focal attention. Uh, if one looks straight ahead, one can still attend to a particular part in the and one can show that in this case, oscillatory activity in the where the attention is focused at. If neuron population Variance of the responses, the discharge rates. So the amplitude modulation of the responses becomes much more reliable. Um, synchronization like across the hemisphere, so from back to front, is greatly enhanced if the local clusters engage in, in synchronous discharges, and in oscillatory discharges. And when neurons engage in oscillatory activity, they focus, and I will give you an example, the time of occurrence of the individual. So spikes become concentrated. They become more synchronous. And then there's also an adjustment of the firing times relative to the phase of the ongoing condition available once neurons oscillate. So it's an interesting phenomenon, and when I skip the pharmacology, that's probably not how this state dependency looks like and how these experiments run. In this case, monkey was trained um, to look at the fixation. It was told by the color of the fixation point. stimuli which were presented at the places where the neurons hit their receptive fields, either the second one or the third one was undergoing a, a, a slight change and if this change was detected, monkey would be rewarded with a drop of fruit juice. So monkeys learn this quite easily and then they and the outcome of such experiments is shown here. Um, so time is running here. Um, Fixation spot shown the frequency of the recorded and in color is coded the and what you see here is that when the uh, there is some power in the high frequency range and then there is more power here in this high frequency range. To attend to this second grating, but this was a catch trial; nothing changed. So the because there's at some stage something would happen, and then the monkey responds, and then all these oscillatory activities break down. Spot that the third pattern will change. Second uh, 
pattern. And even though it looked exactly the same as this one, neurons were firing, but the oscillatory modulation expected. I have to pay attention. Something would change, and then. that this change in dynamics is not The classical assumption for those not in neurobiology was that all neurons can do is either be silent or be active, and then all the information is encoded in the frequency of the discharges that they emit. Now we see uh, the firing rate um, in response to patterns that were attended to and in response to patterns that were not attended to. What has changed <coughs> is the dynamics of the responses. The two different ways neurons can behave. They can discharge there. Or they can cause in, in the temporal domain. Okay. By with this ability to. Um, it seems that it can be used as a very. in these highly interconnected networks. So to do. networks. If one records from two sides the phase relations of these oscillations, one sees that they experience if one records long enough. But good ones. You will see the meaning in a moment. Engaged in the oscillatory activity shared between excitatory and inhibitory neurons. Two phases of very high excitability, interest from other neurons because they are close to threshold and they can. And then they go through a phase in which they are strongly inhibited. They are clamped down by strong. And during this phase, neurons. The conductivity of the membrane is very high. If um, synaptic currents are produced, they will be shunted. They will have no effect on the neurons. Effective to input information and in phases where. If two neuron clusters engage in the same such that the message from A to B around able to communicate to B and vice versa if conduction happens a few milliseconds, so they would there would be no engage either in a different oscillation frequency or Uh, this neuron will always be unable to listen and not communicate. When you can, can put this to a test by recording simultaneously from two clusters, plotting the phase angle of their respective oscillations, and expressing in color um, the exchange of mutual information between those two clusters using different methods and also to examine at which frequency of these phase relations, um, oscillation frequency, this coupling or, or decoupling occurs. And then one finds that indeed um, neuron clusters that engage in a particular phase relation, so the zero here is arbitrary, um, but most often this is really zero, phase rate goes plus minus a few milliseconds, then they couple very intensively uh, when the two clusters move out of phase, coupling gets much weaker. And this 
is an ubiquitous finding. Um, one sees it in, in primary visual cortex of cats, here in primary visual cortex of monkeys, and also in another higher area of visual cortex of monkeys, has been shown in other areas. In, in the meantime, it's always uh, restricted to a particular frequency range, so these high frequencies seem to be particularly suitable uh, for the skating by phase and shifting. And there's always an optimal phase relation for two classes of neurons where coupling is strongest and uh, then it decays with increasing phase angle. Suggesting that coupling between neuron groups that are all somehow interconnected can be modified dynamically by adjusting oscillation frequency and phase. And this is a very versatile mechanism because it's easy to phase shift oscillators. It doesn't require much energy. Um, it's obvious that this permits selective routing of signals and there's evidence now that this mechanism is actually used in order to structure on-the-fly functional networks, integrating a lot of nodes into a transiently existing functional network. Then what it does semantically, it establishes a transient relation among nodes. It expresses a relatedness between something, which is very important if one has distributed its code or needs to define relations, and this is one way to do it. And there's recent evidence um, that these relations can even be nested because there is a phenomenon called, called cross-frequency coupling. Clusters that oscillate at low frequencies, they can be nested with clusters oscillating at higher frequencies which are hooked into these uh, slower oscillations, which would be a way to express uh, graded semantic relations or nested relations, which is very important in order to create syntactic structures. Still a matter of debate whether this is really happening as often as it is discovered. Uh, Raoul sitting here has made a theoretical paper uh, that questions some of these um, claims. Now, since one has an oscillatory cycle, spikes can occur at different phase angles within this cycle. And the question is, does this code for any information, or it doesn't it really matter when the spikes occur. And the message is it doesn't matter. I will give you only one example, there are many now, that a spike is not a spike. It really depends on its phase relation to ongoing population oscillations, um, what that spike means. And I'll give you an example here. Again, multi-site recording with these new silicon probe electrodes that have many hotspots, so we can at the same time record from up to 60 or 100 neurons. And what one sees in this case is that um, the, here is, is the, are these oscillations uh, taken from the integrated potential changes. Um, and you see that these are neuron numbers here. The neuron number one always tends to fire in front of neuron number five or four, and this uh, quite frequently. So there is some consistency in the sequence of firing within such a cycle. And one can now determine who is firing in front of whom or who is lagging by just computing pairwise cross parallelograms between all the neurons that one records. And then one usually gets a slight shift in the peak of the cross parallelogram, which is the relative timing, um, the relative delay between two neurons. In this case, it was three point something milliseconds. Now, if one does this for all the pairs, one finds that uh, this is an additive process. So if, if A leads B by 1.4 milliseconds and B leads C by 2.3, then A leads C by 3.8 milliseconds. It's very, very precise sequences that are established in this way. Now, depending on how many neurons one records from, one can uh, establish what we call firing sequences. So taking an arbitrary zero, uh, these neurons always fire late and these fire earlier. And you see there's a, there's a fairly precise sequence of um, firing times for these different neurons in one of these cycles. These sequences are extremely robust. Here the same group of neurons has been recorded with a seven hours distance in time in the same experiment. And they all keep their sequence with the exception of this yellow one. And they are probably we lost the neuron within these seven hours and found a new one which had another place in the sequence. But 
the sequence gets completely changed and scrambled um, if the stimulus is changed. So an upward moving grating and this is the sequence to a downward moving grating. And so we wondered how much stimulus specific information is contained in this And it turns out there is a, as much information in this sequencing as there is information for an integral. The conventional way to determine the response properties of neurons that takes a few hundred milliseconds at least before one knows how active that neuron was. And here we just took the sequence for each neuron who is following, who is proceeding, and calculated an arbitrary receptive field or a response profile. And we found that these sequences are as telling as the counting of discharge rates, with the great advantage that the sequence can be measured with one cycle, within one cycle, while counting rates takes a few hundred milliseconds before one knows how if a neuron really was. They fire frequencies of five to 10 hertz or so, um, so well, it has to integrate over a long period of time. Since processing is extremely fast, uh, the calculations suggest that the operations that the primary visual cortex has to accomplish in order to segment a complex scene like this one takes um, altogether 200 milliseconds for the primary visual cortex takes about 30 milliseconds. That's the time it needs to do all these computations. And this is difficult to see how it can be done by integrating rates over long intervals. So maybe it's used by the brain, maybe not. This is our big problem. Most of our evidence is correlative in nature. We have some cognitive or executive task on the one side, and we have neuronal responses on the other. And it's very hard to get causal evidence for these relations, because it's not easy to manipulate neuronal activity along only one dimension. One can interfere with activity, but one usually affects temporal structure, amplitudes, and a lot of uncontrollable things at the same time. So there is information in these precise discharge sequences that can be extracted, at least by us, in principle also by the brain, and can be read out very, very fast, because it can be done within one oscillation cycle, in principle. Now, who, who is interested in application of this stuff for clinical questions? Um, if nobody is interested, I will just keep it and tell you what it does. Um, I see no hands, so I will skip it. But then I will be short. <laughs> um, it's obvious that one can use these signatures um, of synchrony and phase relations in order to determine the coherence of large networks. And there are certain diseases like schizophrenia and autism. is wrong with the long-range coordination of activity in the brain in the temporal range. And indeed, if one looks for it, one sees that uh, in schizophrenia this breakdown of the ability to phase lock nodes that are widely distributed over the cortical dimension uh, in response to simple cognitive tasks. In this case, patients had to, uh, and normal subjects, um, recognize these It's a simple task, it needs some binding, it needs some completion. A pattern, there is a strong activity is distributed over different nodes in the brain. Level in the brains of schizophrenic patients. And this decrease of ability to precisely face lock it correlates very well with the clinic, with the severity of the clinical symptoms as assessed by the uh, clinicians independently. And if one plots the network structure uh, that emerges after, or in conjunction with such a simple cognitive task, see that the, the widespread network of cortical nodes or areas or sources in this case get synchronized, face locked to each other over a brief period of time. These are all transient phenomena. Um, they last as long as the conscious passive lasts, which is only a few hundred milliseconds. And um, this is much less so 
in schizophrenic patients. It's similar in autism, and there is a lot to be said about it. Um, then I will also skip um, a developmental study which um, indicates we were interested in it because schizophrenia um, manifests itself in late adolescence. And the question was why does it come so late and what is the normal development of this synchronization phenomenon in the brain. It turns out that uh, there is an interesting critical period very late in development. If one studies again face locking ability in kids starting from age 6 to adulthood, one finds that initially face locking impro improves. Disregard all the details here. Uh, this is a face locking index in late adolescence, again with the simple task. Um, in late childhood, it's much better. It breaks down completely in late adolescence and then it recovers in, in the adult is again at a very high normal level. In Sorry, this is the normal or, or, the, or the schizophrenic? This is normal, normal, normal kids. But as you mentioned, this looks as bad as a schizophrenic patient in late adolescence. And what happens during this developmental phase is that there is a, a diffuse network forming in the beginning which gets more and more precise. But it remains rather global, rather poorly focused. Breaks down at this developmental stage and then it reforms but becomes much more focused. So something very interesting happens here. That late in human development and now they are, after this had become known, this is quite some time, it's in 2009, there have been studies in monkeys in their brains and the synapses in this level. We all thought most is done with them. it just matures a little bit. No, there is this late in the development, there is an exchange of the molecular composition of receptors that change the kinetics of the neurons. There is a change in the matter, in the relation between white matter and gray matter, so the cortex still changes its volume, indicating that there are more synapses formed. In other places it shrinks. So there is a lot of interesting rebuilding occurring this late in development. And apparently something goes wrong in patients that cannot make this transition from this global networks to these more focal networks. And it's now, now we have an endophenotype, one can measure this easily and then dig down to find the mechanisms at some stage. Freud already knew this, he called this late developmental stage uh, Freud's second chance. And parents of kids who had gone through puberty also know this. Now, switching gears, there are some, some mysteries suggesting that some of the computation strategies that the brain applies are still unexplored. Um, because the theories around are this uh, feed forward sequential filtering, it turns out this can't be the end of the story because it cannot solve a lot of problems in pattern recognition. Um, we also, certain schools follow the idea that we have to do with the tractor dynamics. It turns out it's probably too slow. And it cannot cope with the superposition of attractors in the enormous amount of numbers we need to have it. And uh, the reason is that we now know that, a, that per, per any sort of perception, be it language, auditory, pattern, speed, visual, it always requires uh, matching a prior, matching a hypothesis, matching a template <coughs> with the incoming sensory information make a very quick computation, and then segment the scene and identify the object and so forth. And we can do this at the pace of 200 milliseconds for virtually every pattern in the world. And it always works, more or less. Which means that all the priors that we have stored, some of them are genetically imprinted, others are learned, they must be in some storage space available and recallable within fractions of a second. So where is this space? Um, the same is true for the holistic recall of memories. One can throw out a stimulus um, and it will remind you, like uh, the scent of Madeleine Cruz, of an event early in your childhood. It can be there within a fraction of a second or a second. With the same speed you can access, if you're lucky, a memory from last night. And all those in between. How is this possible? 
where is the space where all these memories can be latently there in order to be recalled on the fly such in such short period of time. And then another conundrum that psychologists struggle with is if asked the question, you probably you usually know whether or not you know the thing. And you can even give an indication of how sure you are that you don't know it, that you have never heard about it. And also this happens quickly. Again, impossible to go to the serial search in the memory and so it is there. So where is it? Um, all these priors and memories seem to be somehow equidistant to a search process of unknown structure. And um, the hypothesis is that such superposition of information can only be achieved in a very, very high dimensional space. Um, and the hypothesis one can pursue is that maybe cortex or evolution found a way by developing neocortex to provide such a, a high-dimensional uh, coding space by capitalizing on, on the unique dynamic properties of recurrent networks. Now, this is hypothesis. I don't know whether this is at all interesting for the brain and for nature. But um, now I don't know how, how much I should go into detail, because um, for you is all redundant, for you is all redundant. Um, who is not very much familiar with reservoir computing and liquid computing and stuff like that. You're all familiar. Great. So it's really fast. Um, there are these models around uh, which are pursued by theoreticians, people interested in um, informatics. And they, they move over to neuroscience so, um, because of, of the computation power that these, these approaches have. And they provide a high dimensional space, so I, no explanation about liquid computing then necessary. Um, just to recall you, low dimensional input can be transformed into very high dimensional state space. In this high dimensional state space, classification becomes easy because one can use linear uh, separatrixes in order to segregate the clusters which are widely spread in high dimensional space. Um, then one can superimpose states because these uh, states have fading memory, so the traces last in the liquids because of viscosity and the propagating wave patterns in the brain because of recurrent connections. Um, they have certain abilities to, to encode properties in, in varying ways so that readout is, uh, is easier. Uh, so they have a certain ability to generalize. And then they have this fading memory that I already mentioned. And then readout is fast and can be achieved by rather simple, often linear classifier uh, procedures. So the idea is, well, you have seen all the recurrency in these networks. Uh, maybe these recurrent networks serve as a liquid into which input is mapped, and then patterns are generated, and then certain nodes are read out. Uh, through a linear readout unit, and this is how it might work. Now the question is, is there any indication that this might be implemented in the brain? In still early days, we don't know, but there is at least some indication that it might work a little bit like that. So what we did is we recorded, again, uh, with multi side electrodes, a large number of neurons, in this case it was 60 neurons, or 50, 50, um, which had their receptive fields uh, overlap, in the visual field, and then presented a sequence of letters. In this case, was cats. It doesn't matter what one presents. What one gets is, in response to such a letter, one gets uh, responses from those neurons um, that can be plotted in this raster plot. And we showed sequences of letters. Um, then convolved those spike trains with the sawtooth function that mimics a little bit the synaptic potentials and the TK to get the continuous signal. And then trained linear classifiers, support vector machine like, um, that in the particular time after presentation of A, uh, the unit should learn that this was an A by looking at the five millisecond window of activity across this vector. And it turns out the machine does very well. Um, if trained on the letter, to distinguish between letter A and letter D, this is the performance scale here. 
uh, after the responsive start, after presentation of either A or D, uh, classification performance goes up to 100%, and then stays on over a remarkably long period of time, this is second year or 700 milliseconds. And then our other classifier can be trained, uh, this is another cat, um, and one finds essentially the same. What one also finds is that um, this information about the first stimulus, was it an A or a D, also is retrievable in the responses to the second stimulus, which is a different one. So here you see it still can distinguish very well what a, what, whether it was an A or a D, even though it was measured in the responses to B and not to A anymore. And finally one sees that there are certain responses to B start to emerge, where the, a classifier trained for the first two patterns, was it an A or a C, that is trained to distinguish between is also performing well. So there's a moment in time here but both the first and the second stimulus is simultaneously present in the activity. And in rare cases it was possible to show that there is even an X or operation possible, suggesting some linear non-linearity in this because we use linear classifiers. So we then want a little bit of reverse engineering by uh, scrambling chittering them, trying to keep the overall statistics unchanged. A lot of information was in the, in the amount of um, reduced performance, sometimes uh, performance already dropped by, t by 15 or 10 to 15 percent, suggesting that information was both in the precise time of occurrence as well as in the overall rate. Then there was an unexpected finding that's very recent. Uh, Andrea Lazar found this with careful data mining that stimulus classification improved for late trials. So these animals had seen these letters many times, maybe 100 trials, and it turned out that the classification was much better for the responses to the later stimuli than to the early presented stimuli suggesting that something had been changed in the network, which made it easier for the classifier to find these the characteristic, characteristic patterns. And we are presented passively over and over again. Um, the principal components that describe those vectors, and here just shown in two dimensions, they started to segregate. corresponding to the different stimuli. Um, which explains why it was more easy to classify those things. And the same was true for the trajectories, because I told you that these vectors, uh, they also got segregated. So somehow the network had learned something was passive learning with no instruction uh, in order to orthogonalize them in whatever space this coding had occurred. Then was another interesting and unexpected finding. Um, Andrea went on to do some reverse engineering and train readout neurons to simply reproduce uh, the brightness values that corresponded to the stimuli. Um, and that works, of course. Uh, this was the stimulus and this is the reconstruction of the stimulus using this procedure. So there's no surprise here. But once Andrea had this filter, he could use it to scan spontaneous activity. The brain do when it does nothing. So after the presentation of these many stimuli, um, sitting there, having this filter run through the uh, 50 dimensional vector 
of these neuron responses and show the brightness value. Here's this figure, which was one of the stimuli. Uh, 100 milliseconds later, uh, the network produced the E. And then it produced something that uh, we could not identify. And then the letter C was shown, was really stimulated, and then of course when the responses come, you see the C. So there is a replay of the patterns that had been shown before. So the network had changed some synaptic connections that made classification performance better and that made spontaneous activity replay and we haven't got any uh, analysis of the time series yet. We don't know whether it's regular or whether it's random. But anyway, we know the network plays those patterns back, um, which we thought was interesting. So the conclusion from this is that um, if some of these computational strategies are really used by the brain, um, then we can be very, very sure that we only have analyzed the tip of an iceberg so far. Because all our analytical tools that we apply, uh, they assume tacitly that we have to deal with stationary processes. Most of the tools we have, if not all, uh, look at long stretches of activity and assume that they stay stable. And we now know they don't. Even these oscillatory patterns that you have seen, they are very transient, they last three, four cycles and they disappear and then they come again. Um, we assume in most cases that this system works linearly. There are tons of papers that describe linear relations between response amplitudes of individual neurons and contrast of patterns in the outer world and, and so forth. Um, and there's a lot of effort devoted to proving that even such complex networks are able to stay linear. Uh, but, and accordingly, our measurement tools, they all assume linearity. And if it's... But we don't look for it. And then we also assume low dimensionality. Uh, this is what encouraged us to, to hope that we will find time and relate the discharge is doing. And it's obvious from what you have seen that this cannot give the answer to uh, the computational strategies applied in the system if it uses any of the strategies that are realizable in the current networks, for example. So uh, I guess we have a problem here. Um, and. Um, I think it is as serious for us as it was for you uh, when you had to complement classical physics with, with modern physics. Uh, I think we are at the very beginning of something very different from what we know. Uh, and amazingly, it just so happens that our brain, even though it uses those computational algorithms, like uh, recognizing such a scene, segmenting it in 200 milliseconds and identifying individuals, with respect to the computation that underlie these operations. Because evolution hasn't made us, hasn't adapted us to a world in which nonlinear dynamics doesn't allow us to make predictions, so why should we bother? No intuition for the processes that actually as it may, may look. So, provide uh, for analysis from targeted places in the amazingly complicated cognitive tasks, <coughs> but we lack the mathematics uh, vectors. We don't really know what to look for. From you on what one could look for uh, and what would Prediction, and I think this can be is very to do the same thing as in physics has happened a long time ago. There will be experimental 
translation, and there will be theoreticians who do the theories. So we will have to uh, in respected languages so that at least you can understand what So that's my end. Thanks for your patience. Uh, are there questions or comments from In that case, I would show the recall. Uh, how much do you know about whether in the case the primary visual cortex or by the coupling with other for it correspond the other paradigm of rather on the track is rather on transies and how would is there any indications how this plays together? These are data from an anesthetized animal, so it's unlikely that there is very much loops do not work in anesthesia or very, very rudimentary. The area in which we have been recorded is was Whether a Hopfield net, well, in the Hopfield net you don't have synapses, so it would not trace, and it, the last, last thing means it's not compatible with simple adaptation or synaptic fatigue based on a real heavy plasticity of um, And I was recalling the patterns that were shown to it uh, previously. This, this plane, so it's, it's a random logic on the sequence. I, I said we, we don't have a statistical analysis of the sequence yet. A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, or whether it's random. Campus of rodents that run around and it's been shown that as I showed you the firing sequences uh, of the uh, of the oscillation cycle that seen in the campus when an animal runs from A to B and they fire at the particular place on this trajectory. And they are up and it starts to go down and then this one comes up and so this traces the, the trajectory. So what you can do now is, if you are allowed, represent that trajectory, which while the animal runs, play or respond in real time to to the sequence. Now, this sequence is replayed time compressed. There, there occur oscillations in the 200s. Sleep and the bursts. And the sequence of firing in these 200 milliseconds or 200 hertz um, discharges is replaying the trajectory. <laughs> it is, and it's a very, very robust phenomenon. It's been shown very, very often now. There's another case where there is playback, but in the reverse order. And this happens when the animal goes through a, a T maze and has to make a decision to go right or to go left. And if this alternates regularly, the animal has to remember, what did I do last time when I was here? Uh, I went right, so I should better go left. And in this case, the trajectory sequence is replayed in the reverse order, as if the animal would, but now in, in, not in compressed time, but slower now, as if the animal would mentally backtrack where it came from in order to find out what it should do next. 
So there are these phenomena. Uh, in this case, there must have been some synaptic plasticity going on during the presentation of these many, many patterns. And so far, we haven't analyzed it for a sequence. There may be one. We will find out if there is one. I mean, maybe this is not applicable to the, um, <coughs> the decision task you just mentioned. But if you have a sequence of symbols and you have a very um, strong subsampling of your network, then maybe in a down, but maybe it's just um, present in different areas or um, yeah, the strong subsampling of your network might uh, affect that you know this seventh area actually is then dynamically coming in and out of the symbol. Dramatically, this is obvious huh? because relative to the number, you only look at the Camille or this. Is that after such a long time, you have a replay of the symbol? Well, for the animal, you could, of course, argue why it does. Uh, of course, our classifier has looked for it. Um, that's replay. Uh, because these situations are quite exceptional for them. This is they sit there, they see a monitor, um, they see only a um, So. This probably overrides, at least for a while. We don't know how long this lasts, whether we would find it again on the next day, I doubt it. It's, it also improves the classification performance, uh, but then probably fades away again. And this is uh, other contents come on top of it and then it gets. On the other hand, we know that one trial learning is not a problem for us. Eh? You see one thing once and you have it for your life if the emotional connotation was strong enough. Other questions? Mechanism. Uh, one that phenomena that theoreticians will forgot all the time is synaptic failure. Um, <coughs> from the times when we were satisfied with recording from a single cell, we all were deeply impressed by the variability of this response. Uh, 20 times, and you get 20 times a different response. Sometimes they don't respond. They respond very late, sometimes very early. Voice. Now we know this is no longer true, uh, because if one reports from more neurons, so something more global goes on that is responsible for this. Done yet? What needs to be done urgently is to find fluctuations, because. Um, and still, I know that my neurons behave. Otherwise, I wouldn't know that this is another moment. Otherwise, time wouldn't be encoded. But do you need some sort of probabilistic sampling also? Ways of science. In the early take the mean. Um, that's a very inefficient. We need too much neurons for that. Um, we give our data away. Um, so if you have an algorithm, 
changing trajectories. You just bend the code. This is what the brain was looking for, obviously. Um, they are yours. Most of the recording. So, and in my question, I, I'm more an EG people. And I, my question is whether the general your presentation and um, research in, in humans on. Came from uh, for the simple reason that you see a signal only if a cloud what's going on there would be all Poisson and Uncoil integrate over so many neurons at the same time. So the EEG by itself is already a filter for oscillatory processing. First, right, yeah, yeah. And then the EG, the only pitfall I can see is volume conduction. Um, but you can get rid of that problem by excluding really zero phase like synchrony. So source localization is more difficult with EG than with MEG, but you see more.